Apa dah itu? So yeah, I'd like to take you on a, a brief tour through some of the uh, internals of Lurjet. Uh, if you kind of can't see the screen very really well, then the slides will be on the web, so just put it in the laptop and follow it along from home. Uh, I think a quick health warning, there will be a C code, assembly code, machine code, if you're uh, allergic to any of those things, you might need to uh, give it away for some time. Uh, before we actually get into the uh, fun stuff, I should point out who I am and who I am not. So you might know me as Peter, or as uh, GitHub, or as Corsix so on uh, GitHub and so forth. Um, I'm not Mike Paul, so what I say could be wrong, but just you know, not what he would say. Um, I'm also not Slava or Thomas or anyone else that you might see nowadays in the uh, Lodget kind of team. Uh, I'm not my employer, so you know, the views that you asked here in do not represent the views of the program they are. Um, and So, I'd like to start here. This is how nowadays you can download and install Lurjet. And it's you know, been around for 10 years, so you know, hopefully this is a you know, total shock to you. Two things worth worth saying here. One, Lurjet is now on GitHub. It, this is good. You can kind of thank CloudFlare for, for doing that. And also, there are kind of two main kind of versions currently. That's kind of 2.0 and 2.1. Uh, and there's a good reason to then check out 2.1 so that's where all of the uh, shiny things happen. Uh, so, I'd like to first focus on what happens when you try to make. Okay, okay yeah, make, uh, it's not you know, boring. You can know, you've, you've got some C files, you can compile them, you can get a program out, uh, what can you find? Uh, but yeah, the load is a little bit complicated, so the build process is slightly more than that. Let's kind of start with normal lower rather than lower jet. Uh, hopefully, this is you know, semi uh, you know, correct. Uh, you, know, you start with all of the C code, you compile it, you get lib lower, because you know, lower is a library. And then, of course, the uh, bottom here, you've got the uh, community evaluate print loop, a kind of small program that you know, plugs in with the library. So that's you know, the normal lower build process. Still not overly uh, complex yet. Um, now let's switch to uh, Lurjet. So this is now the kind of part of the Lurjet build process. Uh, the bottom row in our build is a thing called Lurjet rather than a thing called, called Lure. Uh, you know, fairly uh, mundane so far. The library is now the Lurjet rather than the Lure. You know, boring so far. Uh, I think of where things start to get interesting. This blob of uh, O files, I can split one out because he's really quite special. And I'm just going to split out these C files and kind of three things because these are kind of funny, these are kind of fun too. Uh, but still, so far, nothing overly shocking. Uh, so let's start over here. This guy is LJVM for that. Um, he's kind of a big deal. Uh, VM you know, sending for a virtual machine here, and that's kind of where all the uh, interpreter cuts them. <coughs> So, unlike the C files over here, this guy comes from assembly code. Who assembly code? There will be assembly code. Okay, uh, still nothing too complex. Uh, and the first kind of oddity is if you look in this uh, assembly file, you'll see this. Uh, I don't expect you to understand this because no one can. Like, this is an uh, assembly file, right? But those are just like numbers. Like, like what the hell? Uh, yeah, this is a uh, machine code. Other than like that bit and that bit, the rest is a uh, raw machine code. Uh, and like, like Mike is like crazy clever, but like this is like machine code. You have to like actually crazy, not just like crazy clever to write this. Um, so that's the kind of oddity that we'll uh, get back to later. Uh, so we're going to stop here, and I'm going to just add. There's this arrow coming into the the. Uh, assembly file, aka the build process for Lojet generates assembly code during its build. Because, of course you would, that's like a totally sane thing, thing to do, right? <coughs> so, there's this program here called Build VM. Uh, I say it does like one job, it actually does like five jobs. 
uh, if it fills the stuff. So it creates this assembly file. It also creates a bunch of headers and some fluid code. Because uh, of course you want all of these things to be created during the build process. It's a uh, kind of saving rational thing to do. <coughs> so what I'd like to focus on to start with is this app. Um, so if you're kind of actually following along from the just going, like, ooh, pretty. Um, it's worth saying that there are two types of uh, arrow on it. These kind of white-headed arrows are kind of you know, build or compile or link. The uh, black arrows are kind of input or output to a program. So we're saying you know, these files aren't compiled to create the build VM, but instead build VM reads these files as input. Because again, like parsing C code at build time from not your compiler is a great plan. Uh, so going into one of the, the, those files, this is code from the interface. Uh, so it kind of contains <coughs> kind of standard library functions that aren't in any kind of proper library. So one of them is this guy called raw equal. And you're like, okay, this is the code for the raw equal function. Uh, again, like it's nothing overly complicated, it kind of gets two values, checks that they are equal, and then puts a boolean on the stack. So far, so good. The kind of fun part are these two macros at the, at the top end. I mean, okay, so you know, LZLIBCF is a macro that does some stuff, and LZLIBREC is an uh, empty macro. Like, uh, what? Like, why do you get the effort of like, doing a macro here and like, having no body for it? Like, uh, like, like what? Like, am I like, not seeing a, 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 a trick here? Uh, and it's the it's build the end guy. So, so, this guy, when parsing these guys, has its kind of own uh, C preprocessor in it. Because again, that's the thing that you'd want to build. So build VM understands these things and kind of does stuff with them uh, that the normal C compiler does not. Hence why this kind of slots like the odd things which expand to the code. <coughs> uh, again, the other files from the, that kind of blob is this kind of folding code, kind of same thing, but kind of all of the, the stuff that kind of looks uh, kind of useful and it expands to nothing. Because again, it's kind of build VM that understands what's going on then. Uh, so, we're working up here. I've got hmm, lots of stuff that's going to be uh, filled in up here. Maybe. So, build VM by itself is uh, you know, it's compiled from some stuff. Uh, I a few things worth, worth pointing out. That these are the normal fluid uh, headers that can also use as part of the main build. They're all going to fill into this magical thing that builds code. Uh, and then there are these two headers. These are uh, interesting. So, starting with the uh, top one, it comes from uh, this little pipeline. So, right here is a program called mini lua and mini lua.c. That guy is a copy of the entire 5 1 code, compressed into one file, uh, with some bits uh, taken out, some you know, white space taken out, error handling taken out. <laughs> a few things you can in. Uh, so, really the word is like mini, like don't use it for anything other than this. Uh, it contains just what the pull stuff needs, but it is pretty much a copy of the entire file code. So, that gets compiled to create give you mini lower. Mini lower reads in a few files. The uh, fun ones being dynasm.lower stuff, and one of these are uh, VM files. So, we saw. Uh, some assembly code earlier uh, that was kind of over here. We're about to see some assembly code over here, and then this kind of whole step kind of turns what we see here into what we saw earlier. So if you look at one of these uh, VM.dust files, you'll see stuff like this. Again, I don't think you can kind of read all of this now because you know, it's just like code. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that this is a uh, like, Assembly code. You can kind of read this, maybe ish. Um, it's kind of weird code, like L curl on R B. Like, what's that? Yeah, well, good stuff. Um, but this kind of gets turned into that, and this kind of is uh, assembly code without any uh, fun stuff 
um, and the mission said we should go through kind of one for one saying, okay, that meant that, that meant that. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, it's kind of code, it's assembly code, it's the normal assembly code now, nothing overly funky. Uh, just kind of worth pointing out is uh, finance and stuff. So, Logic 1, if you're going to go all the way back to Logic 1, was like kind of a template jit. Said, you know, when you see this piece of bytecode, hit with some assembly to throw out. And you kind of take all of the bytecode for a function, convert each bit of bytecode to a block of assembly, glue them all together, and now comes some code. Um, and as part of that, I had a uh, library called Dynasm that kind of took uh, assembly and kind of pre compiled it to machine code, because uh, that's kind of what you needed in Logic 1. Uh, so that's probably the largest part of Logic 1 that's still in Logic 2. Except, whereas in, in 1, this is kind of the core of the JIT, in Logic 2, it's just used to assemble the interpreter. Because uh, you, know, you actually want a good uh, assembler, and they're kind of hard to find. So you could have took one that Logic 1 had and just used it for build. Um, but because in the kind of Logic 1 context, it spat out machine code, because that's what you could it at one time, that's why you get machine code rather than assembly over there. Uh, like, okay, well, other question, why wouldn't you like directly write an object file? Uh, that's because object files are really hard. Like, object files are complicated, they like binary stuff, with, like a bajillion formats. Uh, so rather than kind of creating one of those directly, because oh, well, that's really hard, like, well, let's just write some assembly code and let the system turn that into an object file for me, because that's easier. Except on Windows, because Windows doesn't really come with uh, tooling or stuff. So there is no good uh, assembler on Windows. So on Windows, this guy directly emits an object file because that's less fast than getting the assembly to work on Windows. Yay, Windows! <laughs> so, a little bit more of this diagram to, to finish off. This is kind of magical blob over here. And this is where this comes in. So, like, there's this program called Lewajit that creates this head. Like, wait, wait, wait. You need Lewajit over here to build Lewajit down here. Life is good, life is good. Um, so, these uh, files and this lower code feed into Logit and out pops in. Like, okay, well, that's going to be great, but why? What's the kind of overall purpose here? Uh, so, we saw some of the, these files earlier, to the, uh, the uh, base library. Looking in one of the other files there, you'll see code like this. This is code in a C file. Like, okay, you know, it's a macro, and we've got a comment. And the code is empty, because of course. And you know, wait, the comment is like the code in a C file. <laughs> um, sure, but why not? Uh, but this is the code for table of four each uh, which is you know, uh, deprecated in, in 5.1, but though it still runs 5.1, so it's there. Uh, and this is the code for table of four each <coughs> And the build process will kind of take that code, turn it into Logit bytecode and then throw the plan code in a header and then that's what it will load at the runtime rather than having to write this guy in C. Uh, so it has to have Lewajit showing them the build to create the Lewajit bytecode. Like, mini Lua won't do the job it's a different kind of bytecode. Uh, and, you know, uh, I said it's the Lewajit kind of bytecode compiler. That's a slight line, a slight line. Uh, if you compile the that code, you won't get that. Um, okay, okay. So, this guy, check tab t, like, that's a function call. That's also a function call. Um, but this over here in the bike code, the company is, a, is type 12 and is type 9. So, when I say this is turned into bike code, yes, but with a kind of funky compiler that's not normal compiler. Uh, so those kind of special bytecodes like uh, is type that you don't normally get, 
you can only get to this kind of funky uh, compiler that's used during the build. Um, but it means that you can invite this in the world rather than in C, uh, which has several upsides, um, which we're going to touch on later. Um, so back to the actual kind of build. The uh, output of uh, this kind of compilation step is a file like this. Again, I don't read this. This is just like numbers. Uh, in yellow, is table of for each eye, because you know, that's obvious, right? <laughs> well, no, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, going one step further through the build, put all of that, that bytecode, which is kind of... all of the you know, files in the Sunday library that are done in the middle of there's like, you know, these summary things, all go in that one file. The next step of the build kind of splits them out per library, uh, so you know, this is the table library, all of it. That's it. Other than like the functions there and some other stuff. But, yeah. Well, almost all of it is there. You get this large blob of like function names, bytecode, other stuff. Blob of magic that gets part of one time to initialize the table library. So, with that, this is all of the little build build process. Uh, and the only obviously is going like, okay. We need the lower jet to build this lower jet. How do you solve this uh, slight <coughs> problem? And the answer is kind of uh, boring, actually, which is this file gets checked in to Git. So whenever you check out lower jet from Git, this file full of like random numbers comes pre built. Uh, so kind of a boring answer to how it works. But it means that you, know, you don't have to say, okay, so how are we going to bootstrap Logit without Logit from nothing in you know, this comment? So that's how that works. Does that mean that the microcomplainer seems very inside the virtue of that being Yeah, the uh, bytecode format is a little bit tricky to change. Um, and it has changed, and we'll get to that. So, um, when they. Yeah, so. I've said this is a file that gets checked into the Git code for Lewis. That's a slight lie. We'll uh, get to that slight lie later. But it's almost true. This is almost what gets checked in. Uh, anyway, so nice uh, diagram. You can go home and study that if you so care. Uh, so, having kind of very, very quickly gone through all of that. There's kind of a few things that we've kind of touched on that's worth uh, exploring in more detail. So we kind of saw two things while the Sun Library was implemented. Um, we saw code like this. So this is the already call function written in, in C. And kind of normal there were all of the Sun Libraries written in, in, in C. Um, actually in normal though it's kind of very pretty but kind of, kind of um, VM core and then the API and then the Sunday library, and the Sunday library works goes through the API, there's sort of no uh, special treatment. Uh, Logit's like, yeah, that's a nice idea, but it's kind of slow. So uh, we'll have the Sunday library go directly into the uh, VM and just kind of play with stuff. Uh, so it's kind of harder to, to, to read the you know, normal uh, C functions because they're kind of directly changing the uh, VM state. Okay, there's a kind of large chunk of Sunday library that's written kind of like that. Uh, we saw this slide earlier, there's a kind of chunk of the, the Sunday library that's written in Lua. Uh, I said that that's a good idea. Uh, it might seem a little bit crazy, but it's a very good uh, idea. So you have a JIT compilation for free. Uh, so, you know, the JIT compiler understands Lua code, it doesn't understand C code. So you write it in, in Lua, and then the JIT compiler can just JIT it and write it shiny. Uh, also, it means that when this guy calls back through f, f can do a coroutine dot yield. And rather than saying, no, I can't yield over a uh, sequel, because it doesn't have uh, con continuations from pipe 2 yet, uh, if this is done in C, it's like, no, you can't yield that. Whereas because it's in the middle, you can yield over from uh, in inside f, which is then probably never going to, but it's nice that you kind of can. Uh, so this uh, bytecode is probably kind of smaller and faster than the C code that would do that. Uh, so you know, it's smaller, faster, jig compilation for free, coding yielding for free, what's 
what to like. Uh, the only option is you have to kind of invent these uh, new bytecodes for things that you can't uh, kind of do normally. So, JIT compilation isn't totally free. You have to teach the, the JIT how to JIT compile those guys. But it, it's almost free, almost free, which is you know, pretty good. Uh, then, there are bits of the sun library that, that are written like this. This is the code for type. That means nice guy, you give it any value, and you can pop back a string saying what type of value was. Uh, this is assembly code, like you know, 12 lines, that's it. The entire code for type, other than like some stuff that done in, you know, whatever. Uh, this is uh, C code, like this is assembly, but that bit's C. Uh, that kind of just gives say, a number that's plugged into the assembly code, so it is just you know, assembly code. Uh, yeah, that's type, and there's you know, the chunk of the, the library that's written like that. Uh, so that's fun to read. Uh, there's also stuff like this. So going back to uh, the base, this is the code for raw get. Uh, yeah, it, it, it takes a table and a value, and it looks at the value in the table. Uh, okay, you know, check tab, that's the table. Check any, that's the key. Uh, and what? Why does it do the lookup of the key in the table? Uh, again, slight lie. This isn't the code for more get, but you'd think it was. You know, it's in the file or the other code for the that library, it's called more get. Like, come on guys, like you think that, right? Uh, uh, so it's a little bit complicated. More get is actually written like this, but more get can fail. And failure cases are complicated and, and, and slow. So the, uh, the main part of raw get is written in assembly like this. But then if it's like, now nah, I can't actually do what you've asked me to do, then it'll go and call it. And it'll only call it when there are like errors. So if it gets called, one of these two things will fail, and we'll never get that done here. Um, but that just means when you can see C code like this, like, like where's the rest of the function? It's like not there. Like yeah, it's not there, it's actually somewhere else. Um, you have to go and read uh, the assembly code to pull it over the gap. Like, like, get yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it would be a fun name, but nah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so those kind of four ways are kind of how the uh, sun library is done, that uh, kind of code wise. Uh, but kind of along with code, you know, functions are objects. It's worth kind of going through what the uh, objects look like. So we start here. This is the structure for all functions. Every function looks like this. Uh, it's you know, C code. Well, kind of C code. This isn't the actual thing you'll find in the uh, loaded source, but it's kind of close enough. Uh, so some things there are just there for the GC. We can get rid of those, and then we're left with the code. This is really what makes a function a function. Uh, so there's some kind of common stuff here for all functions, and then C functions have their own stuff, the functions have their own stuff. Uh, kind of bit that's worth pointing out is this one. This is a bytecode pointer. So all functions in the widget have bytecode. Like, okay, sure, like why not all functions have bytecode? Uh, that's kind of, kind of odd. Like, why does a C function need Lua bytecode in it? Like that's uh, like what? Like C functions like uh, C function pointer. Like that's what the code for the function is. Why do you need bytecode as well for a C function? Uh, so it turns out to be a kind of rather neat trick. Uh, or trick, clever trick, for some definition of clever that might not be light. <coughs> so complex table. Uh, uh, some of this isn't only really, uh, important. Um, what is kind of useful is what PC points to, um, as in what the first bytecode of any function is. Um, so if you're a Lua function, your first bytecode will be one of these six things, func f, v, with the i or j in there. If you're a C function, your bytecode will be this guy called bc func c. Um, and there will be exactly one bytecode in your uh, array of bytecode. That's what these uh, ones stand for. And bc func c is a bytecode 
that calls C function. Like, uh, okay, like why do you need a bytecode to call a C function? Uh, it kind of means that the function calls become really quite cheap. So I'm like, well, is it a C function? If so, go and call that. Is it a other function? If it's not, do that, like that. Nah, nah. Just like run the uh, bytecode for any kind of function, because all functions have them. Uh, there are a few uh, fun things here worth pointing out. Uh, first of all, let's go back and fix the small lie. Uh, so I'm saying here that the first bytecode of any Lua function is one of these uh, BC type things. Uh, but like, wait, 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 like, I told you that this is the code for, for each I. Yeah, uh, slight lie. Uh, slight lie because the uh, bytecode buffer settles up slight lie. This is actually the bytecode for for each I. And there's this sort of extra driver guy at the start. Uh, so these are indexes into an uh, array, and you're like, array is at one because we're in Lua. So, like, of course, it's natural to start at one, but no, no, we start at zero. That's the end. It's all uh, But yeah, so that's the actual bytecode for a jar. And there's this guy called Funkf at the start, which is okay, fine, whatever. Uh, but going back to this guy, so, okay, it can actually be one of these six separate things. And actually, when a function gets uh, compiled by the JIT, that first uh, bytecode changes from func to jfunc. Like, okay, fine, like, whatever. But like, that means like, the bytecode for a function changes. Like, it is not fixed. You can compile it to, to bytecode, and then it can be changed. Uh, this being one main point where things change. And there's also a good point around uh, Next and pairs where things can, can change. Uh, that's kind of notable difference to normal Lua, where the kind of bytecode for function is fixed for the lifetime of that function. Uh, again, if you kind of want to study it, that table, you go, ah, so that's how things work. Uh, kind of, uh, no, no, one, one, one thing is that C functions uh, come in two flavors. There's the um, standard library of C. Uh, and then there's you know, whatever sequence that, that you add. Uh, Logic treats its own ones kind of uh, special, because it's you know, like that. So the little thing is here that C functions that you give to Logic end up in one of two different things of bytecode, uh, because there's this weird feature in Logic where you can say, I want to wrap all C functions. Uh, it's like add a, a try catch block kind of around them because Logit does, doesn't always do uh, try catching correctly. So if you turn on this uh, feature where all the C functions get wrapped, then all of your C functions end up with this kind of C double for wrapped, uh, which kind of slows them down. But then all of Logit's own functions stay with point C and stay nice and fast. Uh, again, sort of trading complexity for, for speed. But yeah, that's what the does. Um, so, other fun, fun thing. Uh, if you're one of these uh, assembly functions, the bytecode that you add doesn't have a name. Like, they're kind of, they're bytecode, but they're not bytecode, so they don't have a name, uh, which is kind of awkward because anyone like talk about them, and from time to time like, it, that gets kind of awkward. Uh, so there, there's this one place in Logic that was like, this is really ugly. You know, like have to plug in the name for the thing that doesn't have a name. Uh, it's like it probably should have a name, but it doesn't. So you have to do this kind of really awkward thing. It's like you know, put out some code from somewhere, index it with some stuff, add, add some numbers, and blah, blah, blah. Like, ugly, ugly, ugly. Just because like these things don't have proper names. Uh, there we go. So going back to here, this was functions. Uh, this guy always points to some bytecode. Uh, other things are not overly interesting. Uh, but that's what functions look like. So, now I'm about to think about how function calls work. Here is a function call, uh, you know, the most simple function call you can write, almost. Uh, so if you were to write that in the C API, it would look kind of like this, you know, get global, push string, push string, call it with two arms, and no results. Uh, hopefully not overly uh, surprising so far. I kind of wanted to say that, so I wanted to compare C API for that call to the bytecode for that call. Bytecode is this. Uh, kind of 
first one is one to one with the C API. Like, get playable is now get, first initial is now case true, call is well, call. Uh, the two and zero become the one and the, the, the three, but it's kind of, kind of one to one, like bytecode is like C API ish, or the same thing. Uh, and in any case, if you're going to do that call, you're going to do one of these two things, and then your little stack will look like this. We'll be going to make a base of the stack down there somewhere, or the trim, or the hello, or the world, and then the stack top over there somewhere. Uh, well, itch, slight line. So each of these boxes is a, a 64 bit box, and actually we'll have a stack like this. So we've got a 32 bit pointer to, to print, and then a 32 bit tag saying that it's a function. And then again, your string will be a 32 bit pointer and a 32 bit tag saying what kind of thing it's been pointed to. Um, again, slight line, but that will do, do for now. Uh, and we're also saying, yeah, like, limited is limited to 32 bits of pointers, even in 64 bit mode ish, slight line, but we'll get to that. Anyway, this is what your stack looks like. Uh, again, 32 bit pointers, 32 bit time tags. Uh, this is what it looks like right before the uh, call. And then after the, the, the call, we get this. Like, uh, not much changed. We're going from this to that. So base is shifted up. And this guy is now pointed to the base wall. Um, it's not actually a pointer, but that's a story that'll take too long to go through. So that, let's just call it a uh, pointer to a base used to be. Uh, like, okay, like, great, like, let's shift it up. This guy, the world's T1, is now a pointer to a base was. Great. And I'm like, yeah, like, that's how a function call works. Like, there is not very much to it. Like, calls are fast because nothing happens. Uh, which uh, makes me feel a bit like, why are you so happy about, like, nothing changing? <laughs> because, like, nothing is changing. It's great. Uh, anyway. That's what the call comes out to sort of change. Uh, so drive that point home. This is the assembly code to do a call. You're like, 10 lines, like that's all the call is. Uh, like there is nothing to a call, that's why that has to. Uh, anyway, like get some stuff out, checks that you're actually calling a function. This bit here kind of shifts up base and you know, puts the uh, pointer in. Then you can start running the, the uh, bytecode. And then you jumped off. This is like 10 lines, like, that, that's it. Calls are fast. Um, slight line, because you know, actually you put like, the uh, funk bytecode on the other side. But again, like, again, like 10 lines of code, and you're then like, done. Like, function calls are really cheap, that's great. Uh, again, if you kind of actually want to understand what the assembly is doing, uh, as it's kind of fun to hear, like, if it's a uh, JIP compatible, then Chit it, maybe. Uh, if not, do that. And then, you know, check some stuff, load some stuff. But, like, there is nothing to a function call. That's quite cheap. <coughs> okay, so, I said that I was telling a few lies. Um, I said this was the stack that you would see, and that those eight pointers are always 32 bits wide. Uh, yeah, that's not always true. Uh, where it, it used to be true, it's not so true anymore. This is kind of a new mode in a budget called GC64 or FR2 or some other terms. Uh, I prefer to call them a you know, fake 64-bit mode and proper 64-bit mode. Uh, so in kind of fake 64-bit mode, everything is still kind of 32 bits wide. In real 64-bit mode, things are now 47 bits wide. Uh, okay, so it's still not like the full 64, but you know, kind of getting that. Uh, anyway, points are now 47 bits wide, tags are now 17. Like, okay, fine, like, that's great, and no. all. Uh, it means that we can't pull the trick that we used to play. Uh, previously, when a call happened, this guy turned into a pointer. But that guy is now 17 bits wide. You can't even fit a small pointer in there, let alone a new 47-bit pointer. So, 
calls can, can't do what they used to do. They have to be somewhat more complex and true 64 bit And to see what happens there, this is the code for the call. Uh, the last line is going to jump you off to uh, some assembly code. And this first bit is guarded by FR2. Okay, if you're in this kind of mode with the uh, big pointers, then shift up to the, the top and copy up all of the arguments. Uh, which meant after all of that, your stack now looks like this. There's a nice big gap here. And that's nice and all. But it means that function calls aren't as cheap as they used to be. Uh, so that's kind of sad. But, you know, the CAPI is a second class system in Logic anyway, so making it so is you know, kind of okay ish. Uh, anyway, with this gap in play, the uh, same thing happens as previously. Base shifts up, you get a point to that base, used to be, and life continues. So that's nice. Uh, but now function calls up slow. And Logic doesn't like being slow, like, slow is bad. Uh, I mean, with the CFI, there's not much you can do. Like, people aren't going to change their, their, their code to be different. Because if you kind of like to get global and now put in a small gap and then do these two things, but like, that's not never going to happen in this kind of crazy. But if you're in my code land, you can say, well, let's try and be clever. So, this is what used to say, you know, the global get into slot zero. And then there's a string to slot one, and then a string to slot two. If you're in 64 bit, well, proper 64 bit land, the bytecode is now different. Uh, it kind of does the get print into slot zero, skip over to slot one, and then load the things directly into slots two and three. Um, so now, even in this mode, calls of Lua functions from Lua, uh, or actually any calls from Lua, is still as fast as it used to be. Uh, but it means that bytecode is no longer portable. Uh, so Lua used to be kind of really smug and say, our bytecode is always portable across like any platform in like any mode. Uh, that's no longer true anymore, unfortunately. Because when you're in this true 64 bit mode, you have to have different bytecode <coughs> So the calls stay fast, um, which is kind of sad, uh, but otherwise things are going to get too slow. So going back to the uh, slight problem from earlier of so bytecode is fixed in stone, right? Uh, yes, except when this guy ch changed it. So I said earlier that if you can check out a little bit, you'll find code like this. Um, you won't actually. You'll find code like this, more numbers, numbers are great. Uh, <laughs> if you're in FR2 code, here's your bytecode, otherwise, here's your bytecode. Like, the changes aren't particularly big, but they are there. Uh, so, yeah, this is actually what you'll get if you check out the just fun code, fun code. Um, so, to kind of roughly loop back to the start, I was saying this is how you check out and download and install Logit. Um, if you're really wanting to use this proper 64 bit mode, you can pass in this extra C flags. Uh, it might become the default at some point, it might not. Uh, but if you really want to play with it, then that's how you use it. Uh, there are one or two small bugs left in this mode. Uh, well, one known bug, maybe some unknown bugs. But uh, it's almost stable, almost ready to use properly. Uh, more testing is good. Uh, so yeah, that's a very nice bot to play with. If, on the other hand, you do want a very uh, unstable branch to, to, to play with, uh, I have this branch called new GC, uh, like very unstable, will crash. Uh, but if you want to play with something that will crash, you can go and play with that. Uh, and on that note, uh, I think I'm done. So happy to take uh, questions on any of that or anything else, uh, and we'll observe that. So, in your DGC branch, are you making a new version of 
yeah, so it kind of follows the uh, design that Mike gave uh, a while back for how an EGC might look. Uh, yeah, it's kind of following that roughly, it's not kind of done everything yet, uh, and it only runs on like x86 and x64. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of working in progress. Um. You could could you use the new bytecode for everything. Uh, it would have to make the old code awkward. You could have not be able to load old bytecode, uh, which would make other people angry. It could require changes to things to make it work. I mean, people are trying to load their old bytecode on the new, you know, when they're compulsive anyway. Yeah, well, well tough. There's no pretty nice answer now, like something that's gonna break, be it like holding either loading old code into new things or you could have into old things. Yeah. Tough, basically. Yeah, it's not like you can get sort of recognize the amount of both. Yeah. Like I think this won't break less, but I can say go ask Mike because it does seem like a sensible thing to thing to do. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you call a map and say, I'd like some memory that I can run, please. Um, or if you're on Windows, like, again, I'd like some memory that I can run from. Uh, and yeah, it's like per platform. But like all of Fluid is per platform, so it's not only uh, weird for me. Any more for any more? Or are we going to go have coffee?